Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Paul Stork and Austin Alexander of Layer 2 Labs, a new Bitcoin company that raised $3 million to bring side chains to Bitcoin through an implementation of BIPs 300 and 301, often referred to as drive chain. This is a fairly technical conversation. We did not do a whole lot of edits to. We talk a lot about drive chains themselves, how Bitcoin miners can earn more fees through drive chains, the history of side chain implementations, and how this whole thing works with the Lightning Network. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Paul, welcome to the Mining Pod. Big news for you both. Uh, announced a $3 million seed round for Layer 2 Labs to bring, hopefully, an end to the altcoin shenanigans in other worlds uh, by implementing drive chains for the masses. But welcome to the show. Thank you both for joining. Hey, thanks for having us. Cool. So we'll start off with a little intro. I, I don't think a lot of this audience, and we even said this before we started, uh, you guys don't know a lot of miners, or maybe you do know a few here or there who are mining at home. but uh, our audience is probably not familiar with you, so I'd love to get an intro from both of you. Paul, hand it off to you first uh, for an intro, and then to Austin, then we'll talk about Layer 2 Labs. Okay, I got into Bitcoin uh, a long time ago, uh, like uh, 2012, 2013. And uh, I wrote, uh, I started blogging about people were discussing all kinds of topics, and I wrote once a famous essay uh, called Nothing is Cheaper Than Proof of Work. Uh, so I started this blog, truthcoin.info, in 2014. And I did that both to talk about Bitcoin concepts and also to promote this peer-to-peer -peer Oracle software that I had written. That was called Truthcoin, actually. And that was supposed to be for Bitcoin prediction markets, which is a whole different thing that we can discuss. But that was how I kind of got in. And then I was actually hired into the industry to work on that, uh, which I did. And then while I was doing that, I presented at Scaling Bitcoin. I got into side chains. And eventually, I authored these two BIPs, 300 and 301, which are about sidechains and merge mining. And now that has led us here, basically. To this podcast. Austin, hand it off to you, though, for an intro before we jump into Layer 2 Labs. Thank you. Uh, yes, I first was became aware of Bitcoin in 2011 and um, was kind of just a, a hobbyist on, on the periphery of my interests. And then in 2000 and 13, um, started getting, there, there, there was like a Bitcoin conference in, in New York and then I went to that and, uh, um, I started getting, uh, really, I would say obsessed at that point. Uh, and so at the time I had been working, um, uh, we were doing like, uh, election consulting and I basically told my boss that I wasn't going to do anything but Bitcoin anymore. And it was the only thing that mattered, the only thing that was important. And so at first, obviously, he didn't take that very well. But uh, after a few weeks, I think he, he came around and I convinced him, saw the light. And we, um, towards the end of that year, opened the Bitcoin Center in New York. And we had... Uh, uh, plans in place to open an exchange and such, but the regulatory situation in New York uh, kind of got a little dicey. And um, sometime the following year, uh, I joined Kraken uh, and I was working at Kraken in various roles um, for the last eight years until a short time ago when um, Paul and I kind of uh, formalized uh, this new business and um, now we're here. DriveChain enables a new tech stack to be built on top of Bitcoin that allows for more inclusivity of different projects. So in essence, I'd be able to build my Ethereum product on top of Bitcoin, perhaps, or something of that nature. Yes. And we already have, we have a clone of the latest version of Ethereum that we made as a BIP300 sidechain. So anyone can test this out 
on our testnet software and you can run it and you can actually connect it to you can connect it to like ethereum.org uh, like they have like little tools and stuff and it will not notice that it won't even notice that it's uh it's not connecting to the real ethereum node it's only connecting to our sidechain version so we have an exact carbon copy of we have zcash and we have ethereum and because that's because those are things that people might actually want to use. So this it's true that it's unfortunate in the sidechain. If you're in the sidechain business, you have to like people think you're like an altcoiner or something, which is the opposite of the truth. But so 99% of the projects are terrible, but there's like 1% are or maybe half a percent are fringe and half a percent are maybe good, you know, like whatever happened to Namecoin, huge uh lost missed opportunity. Uh prediction markets, I think, is big. I think. You know, so we have lots of ideas that are, that could be really big, and we have some that are fringe. And the idea that we could have a Zcash level privacy, uh, you know, it's just I don't know. Like, if you're familiar with how Bitcoin is used today, there's lots of privacy issues. It's a lot of hard work to maintain privacy. There's lots of phishing when uh, when Bitcoin is used in commerce. People don't like they have to give a new address every time, whereas in Zcash the addresses are reusable. So. So the idea that it has no merit and that no one would find such a thing to be interesting, I just think cannot possibly be the case. Uh, but, you know, who knows? But that's the thing is we're going to build this option for people. And if people don't like it, then they can walk away uh, un unharmed. And if, uh, as I suspect, I mean, just look at the huge growth of the yeah, all these, uh, like all these Ethereum product i think a lot of them are not are not genuine of course i think a lot of them are just people trying to pump ethereum and they they have a project and they they fund each other and then they degenerate what looks like activity but again that's that's a big bet to bet you're betting on a hundred percent of the alternatives being having no value and i think that is an unwise risk okay so let me just get a, a question on how drive chain helps mining through and then explain merge mining as well so I'll ask that to Paul. Yes. So merge mining is a very old idea that was invented by Satoshi. It was sort of like co-invented by him. But he it's this idea that you do the same number of hashes, you do the exact same amount of effort, but you can collect the block reward, the fees, and the new coins, potentially, from many different chains. And the counterintuitive thing about this is the... Uh, you can't really stop it from happening, actually. Um, like, so like Namecoin was designed in 2010 to do this. And there's nothing that the, the Bitcoin network actually can't really censor it out. But traditional merge mining had a disadvantage that the miners had to run the Namecoin, so the, the, the second piece of software as well. So you had to run basically the altcoin node. And the altcoin node could be a buggy. It could be a buggy piece of software and it could crash. Um, maybe it wouldn't be as good. And also, you got paid in Namecoin. Uh, and uh, blind merge mining is this BIP 301. Uh, you should read the BIP if you want to know exactly how it works. But what it does is it changes that around so that miners don't even have to do anything. They just, co they just uh, collect all the transactions that pay the highest fee. And one of those is one that nets the fees over. So they get paid with layer one BTC coins. And they do not have to run, this is the blind part, they do not have to run any new node software. So miners basically have to do absolutely no extra work at all. And they just get paid all the trans the sum of all the transaction fees of all these other chains, which could potentially be, I mean, this is not gonna happen tomorrow, but there's no limit to how high that can go. That could be that could increase mining revenues, you know like a thousand times or 10, even 10,000 when you factor in the increased usage from fees and also like increased price because the coin can now do anything. That well, today, the Ethereum enormous. fees are, uh, I think today, literally uh, about 10 X or near, near enough to 10 X uh, Bitcoin fees. So let's just say even a, a fraction of Ethereum fees, like in a, let's say we were in a post, Drive chains world, and there was um, a chain or a number of chains that were um, usurping part of the usage of the uh, Ethereum, even a small part, let's say a tenth, 
Okay, it would double the fee revenue for miners today with a tenth of the Ethereum usage on a Bitcoin or a number of Bitcoin sidechains. And they no and we're doing no additional work at all. The history of side chains is definitely something that I've seen in the drive chain chat, spoke about a lot. Uh, block streams name gets tossed around a little bit, but the history of side chains is something I think we should talk about a little bit before we dive more into the benefits of drive chain and how it works on the mining side. Uh, so Austin, I'm going to throw it over to you. What's the history of side chains in Bitcoin and how they've been interpreted and how we've ended up with drive chain uh, in the seed round? So when you first, uh, first, I think I had heard of it was in 2014, early 2014. Um, and it was, um, I think, just prior to like the big announcement of the blockchain having had raised that um, largest uh, funding round in the industry at the time. And, and, and at the time, it was, it was, it was quite something. It was really impressive. Uh, uh, it was almost jaw dropping to hear that they had raised $21 million was, um, was unheard of. And, and then Gavin Andreessen made that tweet. He was like, if this amazing company offers you a job, take it or whatever. So the hype was huge. It was huge hype. It was huge hype. And part of the hype surrounding it was that I think there had there was the beginning of of kind of a, a nervousness or a stress around around all coins in that um, you know obviously if an altcoin comes and and supplants Bitcoin, then all of the work and all of the uh, investments are um, are for for not. And so I think you know now we've seen that tension um, grow into what we have today, where you know it's quite obvious these factions and um, you know there's they're down the line there they turn into you know nearly cults just. Mention any altcoin, uh, you know, the trading symbol in Twitter, and you'll see the cult come right into your mentions uh, really quickly. Um, but that wasn't that, that that didn't exist back then. It was, st- and it was still a very much us versus them. Us, as in, you know, everyone was Bitcoiners, even if you were using Peer Coin or Feather Coin or you know, speculating on even the most obscure coins. In fact, even Ripple back then. Uh, they, you, I think, that first and foremost, they were they were they were Bitcoiners, and it was all thought of as as kind of one thing. It was us versus the banks. It was be your own bank, or it was us versus the central banks, or you know, us versus the world. Um, and uh, you know, I really don't know how exactly that fizzled out, um, where Blockstream pivoted, and they've definitely. You know, Done a lot of uh, they've done a lot for Bitcoin, and they have some uh, great products. And um, I think the company's been very successful and uh, has uh, become quite valuable. But abandoning side chains was think was very detrimental for Bitcoin um, because, it's, like Paul said. Um, Sidechains on Bitcoin are a coalition building mechanism. In it, 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 it kind of uh, it's something that unifies all the tribes, and so it can it can it can really be powerful. It um and, and you know not only does it, it, it does it uh, uh, unify it, it also uh, something something I think that's really important aspect is if you in, in a post sidechain world. Liquidity would be aggregated. Uh, the fee markets would be aggregated, um, and, and and you wouldn't see this kind of uh, uh, disbursement of liquidity across all these these random coins. Uh, I think it would be uh, the Bitcoin markets themselves would be a lot more liquid. Anyway, you've asked me about uh, the history of side chains, so that was the the beginning of it, and. You know, I think the, the obviously the block size war was a was a big turning point in like the politics and the culture of Bitcoin. Um, it would have been a really important thing for side chains to have had existed prior to the block size war for um, because of that coalition building aspect of side chains. Um, 
and we could have maybe avoided all of that drama. And in fact, all the big blockers, they could have created their own side chain or multiple side chains and continued to hold Bitcoin. And all of that value would have accrued to Bitcoin, all of the value and all of the tension and stress that was went off into all these altcoins would have stayed in with Bitcoin. And um, maybe Paul can uh, interject with maybe those middle years of the sidechain history. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to tell everyone exactly what I experienced firsthand, which was that I got into Bitcoin. I was like, Bitcoin is super cool. I happened to be into prediction markets separately. And uh, prediction markets are also... They're actually subject to failure in sort of a similar way. So I designed this thing. I, didn't, I wanted it to be prediction markets on the blockchain. So what, you might, what today might be called smart contract or whatever. And I wanted to have this peer-to-peer Oracle thing. So I, I started designing this and I was like, there's no way you can bolt this onto Bitcoin. It's just like an opcode or something. You need all this custom stuff to be happening. And it's very convoluted. So I designed my own block. I designed what was basically an altcoin. That it, and I, call, I called that project Truthcoin, but I was a big Bitcoiner at heart, so I never even like I never considered launching an altcoin. I was just doing it for the tech, you know, of course. And uh, and then Blockstream came out with this idea, the side chain, and I was like, oh, perfect. And I wrote to them about it. They wrote back. We were talking about you know uh, a partnership on the idea. We were talking about all this, you know, like how how to, the right way to do side chains, what to do, etc. They came out with this paper in October 2014. The paper had an idea called the skip list in Appendix B that, I, as far as I am aware, it was never built by anyone. And they had in Appendix A, they said, if you just send it to a multi-sig wallet controlled by us, and then we can, we can like simulate the side chain and then we'll give you your money back. We promise. And we'll have lots of other people be in the multi-sig. So this is a very, very naive idea that did not involve any technology. And did not involve anything new. It was not a way to simulate the altcoin. But they, but they were like, they were being realistic from an engineering point of view, and they were saying, "This we don't, that, that's a lot of work to build that other thing." You know, like it's like kind of like how they have uh, the astronauts practice in like a centrifuge or something before they build the actual rocket. So they, were, they had this thing, and it was explicitly mentioned several times. You know, and I have the video and all the bookmarks and everything. It's explicitly, you know, many people made it very clear that this was just kind of like a test type of a thing. Uh, that was 2014. Uh, I got, in, I got, uh, I was, uh, I was looking at maybe working with Blockstream more formally to work on this prediction markets thing. Instead, I met, Ro- I met Blockstream in November 2014. Then I met Roger Veer in, in December, the next month. And he just paid me immediately to quit my job and start working on it, and which I did. And that became what was on BitcoinHiveMind.com. Now the software that is sort of, you know, software is never completed per se. But so I was working on all that. And then uh, the block size war s- started to happen. Scaling Bitcoin one was at, was in September 2015. And then I was like reading more carefully because I was finishing the project, the sidechain project. The so- I was finishing the software for the prediction market, this prediction market. So this fringe kind of prediction markets idea that is a weird idea. And I don't expect, I never expected anyone to like get a huge buy. I was like, this is just my weird pet idea. But I was like, how do I turn it on as a sidechain? And I thought that I, the, the Appendix B thing was actually a little bit uh, overcomplicated and it also had uh, some detrimental features that you could erase if you made the sidechain asymmetric and this other stuff. So then I wrote this drive chain thing in 2015. And then I kind of, I did sort of present it at uh, scaling two in like, they were like, had these, these informal things. I don't want to get too into the weeds on that, but I kind of presented this idea. And there was this kind of folk idea that, Within Blockstream, like that was just it was this thing that people believed and spoke about, which was that you could not use sidechains for scaling. And this idea had just entered the culture somehow. And I was checking and double checking it because I was like, huh, and the thing that I designed, um, you know, the the layer one nodes don't have to look at anything the sidechain is doing at all, because otherwise, how would it work? And so I was like checking and rechecking this, and I was like, you know, there actually is no there is no reason why they cannot be used uh, for, for scaling at all. And so I made these long, these huge presentations in 2016, in June and September, about all of that. And then I presented at Scaling 3 in October 2016. 
And then in January 2017, this is where things started to go awry because I was doing all these theoretical presentations. And then I went to Construct, which is the San Francisco conference. And their Blockstream presented on this strong federations thing. And that meant that they had spent all the intervening years doubling down on the, the, the practice temporary idea. And that for some reason, they had given up on actually building the new technology idea. So then I was very dismayed. And I thought, I don't know what's going on. Like Maybe they found some kind of problem. Uh, or maybe they are giving up. Or maybe they just want to do the easier thing. And I don't know. I don't, still to this day, I have no... I, you know, <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on with that. To be completely 100% honest with you, I don't know why. But I did look into it. And I think they have just a mistaken view on, on merge mining. They have, there's something where they believe something that's the opposite of the truth. And I wrote about that uh, last October. And just to just interject and clarify here, what we're discussing is the liquid federated network, which operates more or less as like a very convoluted multi-sig in order to peg in your Bitcoin, you hand it over to Blockstreams Federation, and then you have liquid Bitcoin, which can interact on the liquid blockchain network, interact with its dApps, but it doesn't have the trust assumptions or the parameters that a lot of people wanted for sidechain to actually have. And I think you've even said at some points that's it's not really a sidechain, it's just a multi-sig. Well, it, it, it lacks the... the dis- I would think the distinguishing feature would be like you have something like Monero or whatever. And so the question is, how do you how do you quote use liquid to to have like a bit monero like a, a simulated monero like you're using these ring signatures and bulletproofs of monero but you use you're spending bitcoin and the answer is with liquid you have to like find a new you have to find your own federation but you see that's the the entire content of the idea is the federation so you have to do all the work yourself it's not really doing anything the idea is not doing anything for you Whereas instead, it should be like a process where you just say, "I want," I click this button, and I <laughs> this now here it is. Uh, so I don't. Um, it's a. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a circular reasoning. It says that the, but you know, they have they have a strategy behind that. What they try to do is they try to say, "Listen, on Liquid, what we're going to do is we're going to make everything so private." Uh, and we're going to geographically distribute the signers, and it'll be private. And this will, these will people, they'll just be like blind signers of just this. They'll just be blindly executing the software. But that doesn't change the fact that whoever has the multi sig keys can just leave with the money, and that is the that is what it is. So around that time, and I'm condensing history around uh, around it a little bit. Uh, we had blockchain building Liquid, which was probably like the most notable sidechain design for Bitcoin. There's a few other things out there like Rootstock, Stacks, etc. Uh, but the main focus shifted to Lightning around that time and has continued to to build up uh, where, Li- where Lightning is the de facto layer two of choice for most Bitcoiners. And DriveChain implicitly would be a competitor to Lightning or an alternative Lightning or make Lightning obsolete. I'm uh, curious to get your take on it. Um, not asking necessarily for any hot takes on Lightning, but uh, just some context for how drive chains and Lightning fit together in the Bitcoin stack. There are ways in which it would compete and there are ways in which it would cooperate. Um, I think the uh, like Lightning Network has a distinctive advantage in the, the fact that the payment is instant. Um, whereas... This has a relative disadvantage because with merge mining, the best you can do is one block every 10 minutes. You can do weird other things where you can change the... You can try to speed up the block time using these weird uh, hacks, which is possible, but not really as meaningful. So in a sense, the confirmations are slower on the sidechain. Uh, so that's one way in which Lightning is superior as a competitor. One way in which they might collaborate is that Lightning cannot onboard without the use of bytes on whichever blockchain you onboard to. So the layer one block size is not large enough to onboard the entire planet to Lightning, to say the least. But you could have people onboard. The coins could go to the sidechain first and then onboard to light, Lightning there. And so then it would be onboarded to Lightning in a different way. There's other. There's all kinds of ways in which they would. Uh, they would be. 
there are advantages and disadvantages. And the, the key thing is really that the, the end user should really be the one who decides what they use and why. Uh, I think it's a big mistake to... Obviously, you know, as like an engineer or scientist, you'd want to make an intelligent guess at what the user would probably want. But uh, this is a case where they would be pretty different, and I can you would think there'd be a lot of a there would be a big appeal uh, for certain. So the one thing that I think a lot of people get wrong, which is very uh, disappointing, because it's so important, which is that d- different people are very different, and different transactions are very different. So like you kind of Ross Albright, when he goes and buys his coffee, he might use something completely different. He might use the large block a large block sidechain or something, but that doesn't have X super strong privacy or super strong decentralization because he's buying coffee and he's walking into Starbucks and his face is on the security camera or whatever. And then when he goes home and he does Silk Road or whatever, you may, you, you may want to use something completely different. So people are different. Transactions are different. And that is why, um, but yeah, the, those are there are big differences between the onboarding is the biggest difference, the biggest advantage side chains have over Lightning, and the speed is the biggest disadvantage. There it is. I awesome. I'm curious to get your take on this, and Paul again, if you want to pick it up, what is the cultural difference here? I think so with side chains, they kind of got batted down. We saw Vitalik boot up Ethereum. It's taken a lot of those transactions. People have wanted side chains, but the Bitcoin culture has not wanted them. They've chosen more or less lightning. So drive chain seems to be a rebellion against that, pushing back against the grain a little bit. We've even seen that in some Twitter interactions so far since you guys made the announcement on Tuesday. Do you guys see it in that lens? Do you see it as something that's like kind of pushing against the grain? Uh, and do you think that there, there's a chance of this, something like this getting implemented in Bitcoin with such a strong push and dominance on Bitcoin ossifying as it is right now? The culture of Bitcoin, uh, first of all, obviously, it's not monolithic, uh, um, as, as I think many of us know. And no one person or even one faction or uh, kind of, you know, I don't know how, how they describe these days. You know, obviously, in the past, we, we had the big blockers and the small blockers, but in that, in the current moment, it wasn't so clearly defined. Once you move forward from that, you look back and like, Oh, that one, he was a clear big blocker and he was a small blocker. And, but at, 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 you know, as that was all kind of developing, it was a little bit more ambiguous. And so the factions that are around today, um, um, I don't think, you know, I think they're a little, they're, they're, they're fluid. And I definitely completely disagree with any assessment that that Bitcoin culture is is against is against drive chains. And I think that um, that drive chains uh, day is is coming up, and it's just uh, the more you understand it. And when you really understand the implications and the power of it, and it, um, you know, the the potential that it has to um, to strengthen Bitcoin and to improve the industry, to improve the relative position of all stakeholders, businesses, miners, developers, users, uh, I think you'll you'll see more and more people get on board. Yeah, Paul. Any follow up thoughts on that? Based on my earlier question or Austin's thoughts about like how difficult it may be. I mean, I think, you know, like I would give up on the idea. Like I searched, uh, like intensely to find like, why shouldn't I do the idea? Like that was what I was mostly doing the whole time. I was like, but, but it's really the, just the case that, that, um, that the people who don't like the idea, it really just is the case that they, they don't know anything about the idea, which I don't even really blame them because so much happens in Bitcoin, right? Like in a given week that you, there's no possible way you can look into every single thing, but people really do not. The 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 any of the critics really don't know, and even the people with a, an extreme amount of expertise, they are just mistaken about. There was this the idea there a kind of fear grew in the mind of the developers that miners would get too professional, and they a lot of people clung desperately to this idea that each person would have one CPU and they would all be equal strength. 
you know, it'd be a kind of a democracy or something. And, uh, and this, this, uh, you know, and that, that idea was very old and people have clung to it desperately, despite the fact that the reality, uh, the, the theory was always never, that was never going to work because the difficulty adjustment fires the bottom half performers every two weeks. So it was always going to be rapidly evolving mining situation. But also in practice, we see the ongoing specialization of miners. Miners now they have to find cheap power. They have to find they have to find like tax credits now. They have to find the best ASICs. They have to manage their balance sheet. They have to do all this stuff. They have to do an enormous number of, of very specialized things. And that is what people were always afraid uh, what would happen. And they always thought that maybe merge mining would contribute to that. But now we see that that I, I was right when back in 2015 when I said merge mining has almost nothing to do with that. That that's happening anyway. And the merge mining part is a tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic drop in the bucket compared to just the ongoing uh quest to have to do more hashes at a cheaper price. And so that that the idea also this this idea was linked to an idea that mining is like part of Bitcoin, whereas really my, miners are actually users of Bitcoin. So the miners need to run the Bitcoin protocol. But if you run the Bitcoin protocol, if you're on a Bitcoin node, you don't need to mine. So it's just unfortunate this uh, somehow in the culture this idea uh, arrived backwards, and it uh, I don't know for some reason that that was all it took to make this. Uh, this idea languish. Uh, uh, I think. I think there's another more practical part of it is that people um, join. They, they they get excited about side chains. Then they become impatient, and then they just leave and they start start their altcoin project or something. So they they leave and they start. They work on Namecoin, the altcoin, or they work on Monero, the altcoin. And now they hate side chains. Now the last thing they want is so they they flip 100. percent and then people join or they you know they join they go to bitcoin cash or whatever so now they now they flip and um similarly who who stays in bitcoin and who who rises up in status it, you know what's a, what's a better sell the idea that we're the we're god's chosen people and all you have to do is nothing and you're going to be welcomed into the citadel and everyone else will be your personal slaves and blah 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 and you'll get all the women and etc cetera, etc cetera. all all just for doing nothing just because you bought you bought in versus someone that says um the user uh we need to make sure that we win the user's transaction we need to make sure that we actually this is a useful thing that takes a lot of work and so that's just naturally a harder sell it's very easy for people to just say oh everything's everything's going perfectly. Yeah, there's definitely some antagonism against any changes to Bitcoin. Uh, I've done a few interviews this year with a few different people. Like you mentioned Jeremy Rubin. We did one with him beginning of the year. He definitely received some pressure for his covenants idea. Uh, the Starkware team is working on some Validium proof ideas or ZK roll based ideas for scaling Bitcoin more or less ignored from what I see so far. Uh, I think it has some promise or potential, but uh, at the very least, I like talking about it, but it seems to me, and not to generalize, but crypto Twitter and Bitcoin Twitter seem to dismiss a lot of these scaling ideas, even though there seems to be a large benefit and there's a decent argument for it, um, just like you were mentioning there. Yes, it's, well, that's just because the Twitter is biased towards people who can get likes and retweets. So that's not biased towards the truth. And that's it's much easier to get like you only have whatever 280 characters so you you know if you want to just say something simple like whatever like a uh, few understand this and then you just get the likes uh i was with adam back on uh at uh, bitcoin amsterdam <laughs> and we were talking about this issue i mean we we're we we're talking about how to make side chains ha- happen faster but we we're talking about like the how long does it take for something to get through and from what I remember, he was like he didn't flinch at all at the idea that a new soft fork would take another five years or so. Like he was talking about simplicity or whatever. So, so that's like a very slow speed. Um, I think it would be better if we just had we had a sidechain idea. We had Bit three hundred. Then, more or less instantly, you could spin up the new sidechain, and you wouldn't need to move slowly. In fact, you could ossify Bitcoin completely. Uh, the layer one part, 
forever, which would be great. And then you could also have the flexibility on the upper layers, which I think is what what that's just going to be. I think that just has to be the future because there's no way to get everyone to agree. Like I was saying at the very beginning, you have people who want different things. A lot of people will say like the current uh, the current thing to say in Bitcoin, you know, the conventional wisdom is just to say, well, people are. They they're gonna learn to love it the way it is, and whatever they're not gonna have a choice, and they're they're going to whatever it is is that's what they're gonna learn to love. I'm not sure if that is you know they might be right. If so, then that's great for all of us as Bitcoiners because it means Bitcoin is gonna succeed, whether or not this company does anything, and so that's great, good for us. But if uh, if if there's any chance that something else could become more popular. Um, that's an existential risk to Bitcoin. And so we should at least keep an eye on it. I, I think the user is going to decide what they are going to use. And a lot of people are going to use like whatever Venmo or something. So we've got to get, we have to compete for the user. Uh, that's what I think is a, a neglected topic. We, everyone's just saying, well, well, they'll be forced to come in. Well, maybe. I mean, okay. If that's the case, then everything will be fine for for Bitcoin. So then, if you believe that, then you don't need to worry about anything, right? Because so then, why you why you listening to a podcast? Why you why you enter just you know go for a walk and just wait for everything to work out perfectly without anything changing? But I don't know if that's in the cards. Yeah, it's a fairly deterministic way of looking at Bitcoin. Uh, just to wrap up here, we talk about the Bit process. What you guys are expecting for that? Um, in a minute or two, Austin, just want to throw it up to you. What is your guys' thoughts right now on using Layer 2 Labs to push forward with the BIPs? And are you guys worried about that whole process? I mean, the BIPs have been out there for quite a while. There's test nets. Uh, there's ways to you know, practice with them. The software is out there and has been for quite a while. But well, what is your thought with Layer 2 Labs pushing forward these two BIPs? Well, I'm just going to interrupt and say, I think it's education or whatever. I mean, Austin, you can... You can say, but I think we're going to try to do that education, communication, uh, idea, coalition building, and you know, demonstrations. We're gonna have, we're gonna release more software that does the stuff. But so yeah, but I am worried about it. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I don't know, like even what, but it's just again the idea. Th the only reason that people don't like the idea is because they don't understand it really, and uh, the idea is very. The, I designed it from the ground up to have no risk to the layer one base chain, but there's to this day there's still confusion about that. So, and I in the original 2015 post I wrote about why it why it could not negatively affect, and then I presented in 2016. So, but still that's confusing thing. So I think that's what we're going to try to do. I think Austin, if you yeah, a big goal of the formation and formalization of. The company and this effort is um, to kind of uh, push forward this education initiative in, in, in a much stronger and more effective way. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is complicated, but from a technical aspect, I think it is a lot less complicated than many other, um, many other bits or... Uh, um, kind of uh, blockchain um, uh, technology, uh, uh, you know, things like rollups and, and stuff like that are, are, are far more complex that once you actually dive in and understand the mechanism um, and the security uh, of drive chains, I think it's, it, 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 I think a lot of people will be able to grok it, uh, I think a little more quickly than some of some other, uh, some other concepts. Um, but but you know from being on the periphery of it for years and you know, even going through the process myself of of through various stages of understanding because when I when I first heard of it I uh, you know I didn't immediately understand I definitely wasn't immediately a, a proponent I was quite skeptical like I am of of everything in this entire industry drive chains has been one of the few things that that I think on every time I look back on it, um, it I, I, I kind of, it becomes more legitimate in my mind, in my eye, as opposed to like everything else where you look back and be like, oh, you know, things that, you know, you had open, been open-minded towards and 
in close up. Um, yeah, I think it's very important that we just kind of present ha- the how it works and the benefits of it in a way that is um, digestible and and uh, explains all these things uh, very simply. That's probably one of the main focuses of the company and uh, kind of our first stages. Uh, as far as like worrying about the BIP process, I mean, I'm sure, it, it, I'm sure it's not going to be easy, but um, I think the, the best thing we can do is just try to build out that coalition and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, even if it, I'm still very, very bullish on Bitcoin long term, um, with or without drive chains i just you know i think that i've come to believe that if drive chains were in bitcoin today it would be a very different industry and a very different picture on a lot of fronts and i think bitcoin would be far more valuable to be perfectly frank um i think it would be far more liquid and i think it would be far more valuable and it's one of the main reasons i'm such a big proponent and you know there's a lot of people out there i'm sure that would like to see bitcoin become much more valuable uh more secure and and more liquid and i think drive chain is just sitting there on the table ready to be deployed and it's one of the most powerful tools that um bitcoin has there and its potential arsenal uh you know it's a, one of the most powerful arrows in bitcoin's quiver that has yet to be fired. Uh, so actually, as, apart from being worried, I'm, I'm, I would say the opposite because I'm bullish on Bitcoin without it, but I'm ultra hyper mega bullish with it. So if we even have a small percentage chance of getting um, these BIPs merged and, and drive chains implemented, I think it's, 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 it's very, it will, it will be a very, uh, you know, I don't want to talk in investment terms, but I, I think it would be, it's going to be a very beneficial thing to all stakeholders. And so, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm actually quite excited about it all. No, oh, hopefully this podcast can be a great first step in towards educating people about drive chain. Uh, let's get last thought. Where can people find your work? Drive chain, telegram, Twitter, is there a blog post, things like that? All first to you and then back up to Austin. We have a we have drivechain.info, which is like that's kind of like the gray matter. That is like a site with all of like the all my technical presentations and all my thoughts and things like that. Uh, I'm not. I think we're gonna have to build something that's a little more digestible to the layperson. That is gonna probably be a completely different uh, thing. But drivechain.info is like that's like what I built to try and show it to the Bitcoin technical community. Uh, and so there's enormous amount of stuff there, including there's a cool YouTube uh, playlist where tons of videos and you can just click through. And if you don't like one, you can just click to the next one or whatever, do whatever you like. There's presentations, there's debates, there's me on a podcast, there's me on a panel, there's all kinds of stuff. So, so we got lots of that. And we have the software is there too on drivechain.info. So we have software that you can download uh, and you can see for yourself. It's testnet software. so. The Bitcoin isn't real, but uh, that's only because it hasn't activated. So uh, you can see what it would do if it were if it if it were real with your own two eyes. And then that's great too because we actually put a lot of effort into the GUI and to try to make it help explain um, what's happening. But yeah, that's uh, that's like its own thing. And we want to work more. That's one of the other things we want to do is we want to work more on making that easy to make it very easy for people to download and try the software for themselves. That's the only way anyone will really know uh, what it's doing. And it's very well done. It's um, far from vaporware. This software has been uh, actively worked on for for years now. And so I think um, for people that have that level of interest, uh, I, would, I would recommend to download and try it out because it, it does work very well and 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 definitely drives home uh i think an understanding of of drive chains and what it what it could be when it's when it's merged into bitcoin and there's also there's 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 some uh, fan sites um drivechain.xyz and and we're working on uh kind of a layer 2 labs um right now we have just a 
like a placeholder site with our company mission and such. But um, we're working on a more extensive site that will explain these things in layman's terms. Uh, and that should be up short, uh, soon in the next few weeks. Awesome. You guys, awesome Twitter account, Medium, any place to follow people for people to follow you? Yeah, I have a Twitter account is a BTC is money. Um, I'll probably try to be a little more active there now than in the past. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for joining the mining pod today. Uh, be sure also to check out the drive chain telegram channel. It's pretty good, pretty lively conversations there every day. But again, thank you both so much for joining. Thank you much appreciated. Hey, thanks for having us.